I didn't know what a miniseries was, never heard of any, hadn't seen, as I say, much TV, period. There was, there was a lot in doing this show that I was not aware of. I wasn't aware that you had to kiss with your mouth closed and, you know, there were all kinds of things. I couldn't believe it. I mean, honestly, I, I, I really did luck out. I mean, that was, that, the character was amazing. Um, everything that she went through, as you say, it was so much fun to play 17, upstate New York. I really felt like I was there. It was so, it, it was just so interesting in the, in the period, especially in that particular time. And we did so much on the back lot at Universal. I mean, I honestly, my memories are almost like I lived that. I feel like I lived it. And it was interesting because I was in my mid-20s when I did it. I think I was 25 when we shot it. And um, I remember I thought playing 40. Oh, I really had to do old age makeup, you know. In fact, the people from the tower came down and complained to the makeup guy. But I was doing it myself because I'd seen him do it with a sharp pencil and then you'd wrinkle all up, you know, and then you'd do all of this. And, but, but, you know, when I hit 40, I look back and think, what was I doing? They were right. <laughs> but you don't know, you know. You know, it's funny because I remember Peter so strongly as uh, I have such strong memories of, of him in the beginning of the movie, the most then, because it was my favorite part too. And he did, he has vo his voice very high. I remember him leaving after some scene that, that we were on the porch and, um, Dor um, oh my gosh, um, Gloria Graham played my mom from Oklahoma. She was saying that song, I'm just a girl who can't say no. Anyway, she was so, so cute, and she came out, and, and I remember saying something like, oh, mama, for Pete's sakes, and I was doing my hair in braids. I mean, I was playing 17, but I, was, I already had a round face. I was acting 12, you know? <laughs> but it worked somehow because you, you had to have this difference, and I remember as Peter was leaving, I can't remember if he said, after a while, crocodile, or <laughs> something like that. It was so cute, and you know, people talk like that in those days, and he played that sort of goody two-shoes character and straight lace. My character was moving along faster than his. Oh, for me, much, much tougher to play the older. First of all, I talk fast. I had to slow down. I had to remember to talk slow. I mean, I pretty much do in every role I ever play, except for once when I played a speed freak. <laughs> so I have to do it anyway. Uh, you know, in comedy, you can, you can talk quickly, but, but not so much in drama. So for that, for me to play someone older, I think to myself, though, once again, not just the makeup, the energy I still had at 40. I mean, now I'm in my 60s, you know? So please, of course, uh, I was acting as if I were an older person in energy, too. And I think, you know, and Peter did the same thing. We lowered our voices and all of that. Well, you know, the sad part for me was, because I, I grew up as a reader. In fact, I didn't grow up with much TV at all. We didn't even own one for quite a while. But um, I would have, I immediately picked the book up, and I got so confused from what I've been reading the script, because it, I just remember it was Rudy's sister and his girlfriend. It was more the sister, actually, but of course, obviously, I couldn't be the sister, because, uh, so it kept switching back and forth into to really different personalities. Do you know what I'm saying? So there was no way I could really use, uh, even though I do feel that the writing, especially from the book, was, was wonderful. You, the dialogue, anything that was from the book, I loved it the most. And, you know, a novelist just has so much more time for that. And I think that um, it made it a little tougher for me. But I, I couldn't. In, in fact, I mean, I couldn't really read, I couldn't finish the book. I did not finish it. I stopped myself from reading it. I'm remembering um, she, she, Julie has a baby that she, after the baby, she gets postpartum, what we call now postpartum. I don't know if there was a name for it in the 70s. I guess there was. But I remember the director's wife had gone through it, David Green's wife, and he was talking to me about it. And, you know, I was brought up with this army kid. There was a part of me that was the most difficult because I didn't really believe, I really believe people should just snap out of something like that. You know, like a lot of people believe. If you have not experienced something like that in your life, in depression or anything else, playing depressed, by the way, is difficult. Talk about having to, you know, slow it down. And, but there was a part of me every day that just wanted my character to shape up. You know, and then I mean, then, then there was a lot of big drama when, when I'm an alcoholic and so much stuff happening, you know. You know, thank God I didn't know enough at that point. I mean, now, you know, I've lived long enough to have many, many friends in AA and a lot of people I could have talked to. But uh, um, I, I think that, I think that it, was, it was in the words. It was there. It was in the script. And I remember a line that she said that, I believe you, me, I've known alcoholics say the same thing, where he comes in and he says something about you're drunk. And I say, I've had a beer, one beer. 
And you know, that is something that you'll see it with the cops when they pull people over on those shows. They always say, I just had one beer. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, mainly for me, because I, I didn't see much TV growing up. And there were two people. There were only two. It was when I was a kid, I, I was in love with, with Lucille Ball. And then as a teenager, Carol Burnett. And, and uh, I didn't even know the story. And, and I met her, and, and we did some things, you know, some charity things, and she never mentioned it. But then I read it. Uh, I found that she had, I found out that she had um, seen a movie I'd done that had just, that had just come out, and it was called Report to the Commissioner. And it had been, it was playing in Malibu, in, in the little theater there or whatever. And she had seen it there, and either, yes, I think she had seen it there. I know that, I know that's where Harve Bennett saw it. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe she saw it in town. And it was playing there, and she told Harve Bennett, the producer, that he had to see me for this role, because I guess she'd read the book or knew something about it, knew Harve. So it's interesting that when you're, you have an idol like that, that then was responsible for so much of my career, it's just a lovely thing. She recommended me. She recommended me from, report, from seeing a movie called Report to the Commissioner. I, I think she was, she's hysterical. She, I mean, and again, she got to do that sketch comedy, which is even, she could even be broader. And, and yet she always had the reality. And when she had that, the reality with her mother, when she, when she was playing the mother, I'm sorry, she was the mother, right? And all, everything that she did with Tim uh, Conway and, um, and um, oh my God, I'm blanking on... Thank you, Harvey Corman. I had to say his name every night in a play, too. That I had slept with Harvey Corman in, in crasser terms. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she was so funny with them and um, Vicki Lawrence. Just the way that the, they all interacted and, and they kept the reality and it was always, they always just knew. I mean, the writing was obviously wonderful, too. But she was just, you, you know, you know it, it's hard to explain. It's very difficult to explain why somebody is funnier than someone else. But those two... Really, and then Gilda Radner, there's been people since, of course. But. Once again, I had not seen much. I just, it's, when I saw her, though, and then I think later when I saw other sitcoms at the time, none of them had that kind of impact on me until Carol Burnett, which wasn't a sitcom. But, um, and I didn't, as I say, I didn't see much. But she right away, I think Lucille Ball, you just felt like this, you know, she had, she just always had her funny bone going, you know what I mean? She knew how to take, she had timing, she knew how to make anything funny, and she was beautiful. And I love that in those days, you could, you could play that big, you know, and do it in that silly way. She just like she was having a good time. And you know, it's interesting, uh, my husband had said to me recently something we were talking about, because I love comedy, and I really wish my whole career had been comedy. And he was saying, well, I think that after Partly Rich Man, Poor Man, that after that, I did a lot of TV movies, one heavier than the next. You know, I was actually passing on so many because they were all heavy. That's what TV movies were like in the 70s and, and early 80s. They all were, you know, the problem of the week, the disease, the, the, you know, I mean, I did play a drug addict. I played a speed freak, you know, but I mean, there was always something like that. And I said, you know, it, people didn't see it. We did one TV movie for ABC that was comedy, and they almost never did any. I don't know if they did more. You know, think about it, all the TV movies back then were all dramatic. You know, you asked me earlier about when I, when I read the, when I took the role. I, it was the first TV thing I was ever offered. And uh, I had just done some big movies, and they, in those days, you pretty much had to stick to movies. It was one thing if you did TV and then went up to movies, but you weren't supposed to go from TV, from movies into TV, you just weren't. They said it would really hurt your career. But when they sent me this, it was so much better than anything I was being said for film. You know, I wasn't that established uh, in, in film, obviously. But uh, and I, I wonder even if I were that established, if I got, would have gotten a role like this. I mean, it was obvious this was why I was an actress. And I hadn't been in L.A. long. I was a New York actress. I didn't care anything about the game. I refused to play it, first of all. I just didn't believe that you should. I think, of, I think that becomes the norm by everybody doing it. You know, so why not not do it? And so it was just too good of an opportunity to pass. And uh, I didn't know what a miniseries was, never heard of any. Hadn't seen, as I say, much TV, period. There was, there was a lot in doing this show that I was not aware of. I wasn't aware that you had to kiss with your mouth closed. And, you know, there were all kinds of things. Uh, I, I don't know if it was still in the time where you had to sleep in separate beds. You know, the, everything was so, <laughs> so provincial back then. You know, I think when you have a really good story, that people can follow. And I wish there were more of these, by the way. Uh, I mean, nowadays, that, that's why I think so many series follow a story within the sort of a week-to-week -week episode, and I prefer those myself. I think that people get 
you know, we get hooked on people that we know. Obviously, it happens in soap operas. I never got into soap operas, but I was thinking about doing one once and started to watch one, and I could see you could quickly get hooked on them. So I think in this particular case, um, it was the best of anything like that that had ever happened. I mean, it was such a good book. And um, all, I think this, the, the two brothers being so opposite and having this pretty horrible upbringing, I mean, not terrible, and the mother was, you know, close to, closer to, to Rudy, obviously, but um, I think that you identify, we all identify with wanting our parents' um, approval and how much uh, Tom Jordash, Jordash's character, I mean, how much he wanted that and how Rudy was somebody that was sort of like the American dream of moving up in the world and uh, um, the image that people have of somebody who's perfect and then when he becomes a politician, you know, uh, and, his, and sort of his, I think it sort of dealt with his struggles of becoming that perfect boy to man for other people, living within that image for his mother and uh, trying to take care of his mother. I think there was so much that people could identify. And with my character, this was in the mid-70s when this came out. And so, and my character was ahead of her time, obviously, when he wrote the book. The fact that she wants to have sex before her, her teenage boyfriend will, and then, you know, and I, then I viewed Rudy differently at that point. I just didn't feel the same about him, and that's why, when I say I, <laughs> Julie has the affair with uh, Teddy Boylan, uh, one of my favorite actors, Robert Reed, who was so fabulous. And it's just that she's ready to move on, and so many people identify with that at a certain age, no matter what, wanting to move on, not wanting to stay in the same town, which at that point Rudy did want to stay in the same town. My character wants to go to New York City and get out and enjoy life, you know. It's funny, I remember us making out in the backseat of uh, Teddy Boylan's car. <laughs> and it's just, it was so much like we were in high school during those times. And then, and then when I go to New York later and I meet, was it Billy Abbott? I'm trying to think of, uh, I think his name was, the character's name, it was Bill, uh, Bill Bickley. Bill, Bill Bixby. Bill Bixby, sorry. Bill Bickley is somebody else I know. Bill Bixby, who I love too. I just love working with him. And then there was that whole New York, that whole exciting thing of going to New York as a young person where she's trying to be an actress and she's terrible. <laughs> it was, it was incredible. And even though I had had some fame as a model, um, it was nothing like what happened with this. I couldn't go anywhere without, and I, I actually wasn't that comfortable with that sort of thing. I don't know how people today deal with it at all, but it was really strange. And, peop, and famous people, like when I met Carol Burnett, by the way, the first thing she said to me, still don't forget, I didn't know anything about her being responsible for me getting the role. She said to me, oh my God, you've ruined my Monday nights. I have to stay home every Monday night and can't wait to see the show. And people were saying that all the time. So that was really fun to get to meet people that you had idolized and know that they were home watching the show that you were in. I mean, I don't consider it my show. It was more Peters and, 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 uh, and Nick Nolte's, but, you know, the three of us. They always send the ads and the woman they both loved, although I really didn't get to do that much with, with uh, the Tom Jordache character with Nick. They didn't, he didn't love me. That was just a promo thing, in other words. <laughs> I had just come off of, I mean, when I was in New York, I, I studied with Sandy Meisner. And, you know, I, did the, I worked with Strasbourg, too, and I studied with all these people. It was all method, and especially Sandy Meisner's method, which I thought would be perfect for film because there was so little time to rehearse that basically you would run your lines. You, you wouldn't memorize your lines, and I still do this, by the way, a lot of the times. You memorize your lines like, ba, 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 I am leaving you, Rudy, I never want to see you. So you don't have any idea how you're going to say it. Now, that couldn't have been easy for him working with me. <laughs> Do you know, because he liked to work it all out. Now, when I worked with Nick, it was fantastic. Um, but working with Peter, and, and by the way, over the years, I've changed my own methods of working, and I was pretty much a novice, much more than the other people. I mean, it, I wasn't as experienced at all as, as the other actors. So, uh, but it was all just, you know, it, it was... It was interesting. I remember during that time, certain actors loved that I did that, even if they hadn't worked that way before. I remember David Green saying to me something about it he said something when I first told him that I just want you to know I'm gonna work this way I remember telling him on the meeting for some reason I didn't have to do an audition because I think because I was just coming off these movies and every the other the boys were auditioning and all this I was so lucky that I didn't have to audition might not have gotten it <laughs> but it, that's probably true but he said I said you know I'm not going to be doing rehearsals in a I just want to do it this way I want to warn you until you know if that's okay he, and I remember he said well that's highly unorthodox I said yeah I guess it is I don't know but why not you know and then he liked it. In the moment, I'm, I'm telling you something, or I'm listening to what you're saying to me, or, but I haven't planned out how I'm going to say it at all. 
and I and therefore when when we start to do it, the reason I didn't want to do a lot of, a lot of rehearsal, I didn't want to start hearing it repeated a lot. But they, they didn't do a lot of rehearsal anyway. Believe you me, I didn't have to worry. There was no time for rehearsals. So I think it just kept it very fresh, and I still will try and do that some of the time, depending on what I'm doing. Like with comedy, I don't do that at all. With comedy, I have to really work it out, because I think how it sounds and the timing is so important. And I think a lot of stuff, like if I'm doing an accent, I really work on how it's going to come out much more. So there's, and I, and I, but I think that, and I remember some other actors, I worked with some other older actors who, who actually love this, because it kind of makes it a fun game. You have to be in the moment. You have to be listening, and you, you don't know how, you, like I don't know how I'm going to say this now. You know what I'm saying? I have no idea how this is going to come out. So the thought comes, and it comes out in that way. Does that make any sense? Oh, no, absolutely. It's the Meisner technique, and I just think it's brilliant. And as I say, I often still use it. And isn't it interesting they were like their characters? Because, by the way, I do think that there's a part of me that feels like I lived through that with them, and then we were in that little town. And I do know that there's, uh, I mean, this is a long time ago, right? So in my memory, and even, but even after I did it, I feel like a lot of those people were th the actors that I knew, I knew through those characters for that period of time. And many of them were like their characters in certain ways and definitely Nick and Peter were my girlfriends and before and since people I meet women fell in love with Rudy Jordash the character so it's interesting women I think fell in love with him but I, I think when you read the book that you tend to, to, to your heart goes more out of course to Tom because he has all these tragedies and different things in his life he's treated so badly I remember one of my, my favorite parts of the book is and, and, and the movie the, the the miniseries, <laughs> is when he is kicked out and he goes to live in Ohio with his brother, with, with um, uh, Ed Asner's character, A Alex, Ax Axel? Axel? Axel, Axel, George, when he goes to live with his brother, and there was this wonderful actor who I think was German or Swedish or something who played, his un played Tom's uncle, and then he falls in love with Fionua Flanagan who I remember he names his boat after later. I think her character was Cotilde, because I remember the name of the boat later. And she was so good. And it was such an interesting uh, love affair with her being the housekeeper and being older than him and her having to live under those, those rules, un being under the thumb of, and that character was pretty bad, the uncle. Do you know, I can tell you one thing, for instance, that's very interesting to me when I, when I think back about this, and I remember thinking this afterwards, is it was interesting how they didn't look down on any, I mean, I never felt like I was being, you know, looked down upon by these actors who had so much experience. They really had their chops together. But they, you know, I thought that all of the actors that I worked with, I mean, in particular, I loved Robert Reed. I thought he was so interesting. He played that debauched sort of character that was a, a wealthy sort of playboy. And he had such, but he had this sort of pain behind his eyes. And he was so interesting and so smart and had made such interesting choices. And uh, Robert Reed, of, I mean, and uh, Bill Bixby, of course, who I just loved. Um, but there were so many, I'm trying to think, well, Talia Shire was in it, but she was young too, but she'd been in Rocky. Talia Shire and Kay Lynn, who I adored. Um, and um, who else am I thinking was in this? So many, so many good, so many. Linda Day George was in it, and uh, I'm just trying to think. There were a lot of loves that 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 Nick Nolte had that were, you know, between Fianula and then Talia, and they and then Kay Lenz was, I guess, the final one. Um, but some of the older actors, like I worked with Dorothy Malone, she was in it, and uh, and Gloria Graham, of course, played my mom, and Craig Stevens was my boss, I think, at one point. And I'm trying to think, Steve. I have to ask my husband this, wasn't... Ray Milan. Well, Ray Milan, yes, that's right, Ray Milan, of course. But wasn't also, who was the, I'm trying to think, the famous Steve talk Allen. show? Steve Allen. Right, Steve Allen. <laughs> yeah, we actually interviewed him. He was, point. you did? Oh, he was so much fun. What a nice man. I, I don't think it's nerve-wracking. I mean, nowadays, I would be a nervous wreck because they're all naked. Oh, my God, you have to be nude. I mean, that, that just must be, it must be... You decide to be an actor, but you've got to be nude. And listen, I was in those days, I was sort of a hippie, so that maybe it wouldn't have bothered me when I was young. I don't think so. In fact, I have some nudity in other films. But I think that uh, love scenes in general, no. They're, they're not difficult. They're just like anything else. They're just like any other scene. <laughs> People don't understand, but they really are. You know. I gave my husband. <laughs> I met him through Richard Chamberlain because Steve was handling, Steve was doing PR, my husband Steve Jaffe, and he came to the set 
uh, to to talk to um, Richard about some stuff. And now we didn't really really hit it off that day. That's another story. But that's how I first met him. So I gained that. No, but Richard was wonderful. Richard, I had a great time working with Richard. I and mean, he's such an accomplished actor. And what I remember about him is how much he cared to improve himself. I had never seen Dr. Kildare, as I told you before. I hadn't seen much TV. But I remember at the time he was going off to uh, London and, and doing Shakespeare. You know, this is an actor who wanted to improve himself every single day and it mattered to him so much and when I was that age in particular when you come out of all those classes you care so passionately about the work and it's so lovely to work with people who care like that especially for somebody who had been a big star like Richard was and was a leading man in, in a, a romantic way on these uh, these all of these maybe more I guess he'd done more I don't know if Dr. Kildare was the only one but he certainly was a big star and um, he wasn't happy to he wasn't happy to rest on his laurels. He wanted to improve himself, and that's just that. I think in those days, maybe you didn't see it as much. I think now you probably do. It seems to me like the acting has gotten so good nowadays. It just blows my mind how good these young actors are. Oh gosh, yes. Well, mainly the chimps, <laughs> because there was something. There was some sort of legal problem that they couldn't. I was so excited when she called me. I was just so excited about the baby chimps that I was going to get to work with baby chimps. Then it turns out there was some sort of law, and there were already some baby chimps that had been brought into Canada. So we had to use these big, ferocious, scary chimps that were terrifying. You weren't allowed to look at them, and if I, usually they were in the cage, but they would freak out and be yelling. They were males at the wrong age, whatever, whatever that age was. And, and I had some scenes where I had to like hold their hands and I, and, I, and I had to never look at them. I was so nervous just to like to hold the hand and then do the acting to someone else. And make, Cause I had seen these and they, they said they would, tear your, they would tear your throat apart. They would just, in one second, they had people like around them ready to, pr to pounce if they came at you. <laughs> no, but Michelle was wonderful. And you know, in this particular movie she plays, she goes from, uh, a, a mentally challenged woman to a genius, as I recall, and then I think she goes back again, right? Um, and in fact, we were watching Planet of the Apes, and I said to my this this new one out with um, with uh, Andy Serkis, and I said to my husband, you know, it's like they took that story from Michelle's, right? I mean, it's it's very close to that story. Um, but I thought it was, it was really interesting to watch her. I mean, she had so much work to do all day, and she was so professional. And she's such a giving actress, uh, really helpful as to have her, something like that be your director. Well, I don't think that a Falcon Crest was so much over the top. I, I, but I really hadn't gotten into any of them. Uh, um, I didn't really watch a lot of them. So when I did it, my memory of it is just my little part, and it isn't even that good. <laughs> I can't quite, you know, I did. I was on six episodes, and I think I played... Um, Gregory Harrison's sister, as I recall, but I can't remember. It certainly didn't have any depth for me for what I was doing. I don't remember. Uh, uh, I don't have strong memories of it, but I, the little bit I saw of the show, I thought it was really well done, and I don't think it was over the top or campy. I thought that they played it straighter maybe than the little bit I'd seen of Dallas or Dynasty certainly was, was over the top and fun, you know. One thing I was thinking is that the, uh, the writer-creator, the writer, the, uh, Richard and Esther Shapiro, Richard, uh, was they were somehow involved, I don't know, if, I think they were involved at ABC with Rich Man, Poor Man, and then they went on to do Dynasty, and a lot of, they did a lot of stuff, but um, yeah, they, I'm sure they did, and I, 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 I'm surprised they didn't do more miniseries. I mean, one of the things that happened with us that was very unusual, because this had never been done before, a miniseries, none of us were signed to go on. Now, of course, Nick's character dies, he couldn't go on, but there was quite a thing because I didn't want to go on. I wasn't sure how the writing would be, and I was fussier than my talent deserved, I have to say, but I wouldn't sign. And, and my husband was reminding me because when I just did, um, I did a couple of um, Two and a Half Men, and the, um, the producer of the show, um, what is his name, Eric? Is Eric? No, 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 the uh, Eric. No, no. Um, Tom Tannenbaum, Eric Tannenbaum, was that his name? Oh, yeah. Eric Tannenbaum's son. Yeah. Eric, Ta Eric Tannenbaum was the producer. We were, and Steve would say, do you remember with Tom Tannenbaum taking you to the Palm and saying, Susie, blank check, blank check. Just start with any price you want. And I was sitting there in my stupid little naive, caring so much about the work being perfect. No, no, because I don't know how it's going to be. I just don't want to do it, you know. <laughs> because, but they wanted to kill me. Because, and I agreed to do one day. I didn't want to, you know, leave them. You know, I, I couldn't, it couldn't be a cliffhanger. They had to kill my character off, but 
that was an opportunity that very few actors ever get. I threw it away, I t uh, and Peter didn't. You see, he's like his character. He was smarter. <laughs> Well, you know, I never think of it as me starting because I was just the actress for hire. But yes, I think that they, the people who knew to do this, Fred Silverman and uh, Br um, Brandon, um, Stoddard. Brandon Stoddard. I started to say Brandon Tartikoff. Brandon Stoddard, of course, Brandon Stoddard. He was so much fun. Darling man. He, he, that they knew to do, do this, you have to hand it to them and um, all the people who were involved. You know, uh, Dean Reisner for writing it and... Uh, those are the people that I think really did start something. I'm surprised they didn't do a lot more of them after that. They did some, but I'm surprised they didn't do more. I still, I still like anything like that. And occasionally there are shows like this that are going to have an ending that they have. I'm trying to think what I've seen recently. But I mean, when you watch anything now, now if you get attached to the characters, and I do, like with Six Feet Under, I was very attached, Deadwood, and then they're over. They stop, and, and lots of times they don't get to really have an ending that you that you want because it's not planned to have it you know it's not planned with an ending which is probably why I mean I think that this I don't really know but I think that the series they did of Rich Man Poor Man was somewhat successful but I know it didn't go on I don't think more than a year and I think that's just about the fact that the other one was written with all of the arcs as you say and it was a book it was a novel well you know it's funny that you say that because I remember very strongly that I was excited to, to do it and it was to play opposite Anthony Hopkins as Hitler oh my god and we were shooting in Paris it was like a dream job and those are the days where you got huge per diem oh my god I love to eat the French food I had a lot of time off I was so excited about this job so but then when I started to read it I thought well I'm I, you know I, I need to really study the history oh my god it was so depressing my heart hurt so badly that I kept thinking oh my I, I literally would get weak from trying to read about what happened. This is the man I'm supposed to be in love with, very much in love with. So I remember at one point just thinking a couple of things. I thought, I don't know that she was the brightest. She, was, she wasn't highly educated. She was sort of a peasant, Eva Braun, Eva Braun. And I thought, I'm going to play her like a groupie, like I get to marry a beetle or something, you know? Somebody I would look up to as the most amazing person to be married to. And all she knew, and a lot of Germans, I'm sure, only knew what was going on I'd, it's still hard for me to believe that people knew, you know, what they were doing. So I thought I would play it like that, and I would, and then I thought, Anthony Hopkins. I'll just, I don't have to imagine it. I'm in love with Anthony Hopkins. And then the very first day at this beautiful hotel we were staying at, the Plaza, the Plaza, no, the, um, what is it, Steve? Prince de Gaulle. The Prince de Gaulle. That's what we were staying at the Prince de Gaulle. I remember the little teensy tiles, a beautiful hotel. And I was just checking in, and across a huge lobby, I see a man from the back, and I'm thinking, oh my God, that seems like Hitler. And then I turn around, and it was Anthony Hopkins. And I, to this day, I don't know if he was already getting into character, but there was something about his body language I think he was. I mean, what, what was that, you know? <laughs> well, with Joan Kennedy, of course, she, she's alive. You know, she was still alive. So uh, I, it, it was sort of, um, it was a little tricky because you want to, you want to honor them, and you certainly don't want to uh, embarrass them in any way or anything else. But I felt that she'd been very open, thank God, about her drinking problems. And, and I, I think that basically I just played what was in the script and tried to be true to that, tried to be true to the words and the story that really happened. I mean, it was a true story about their son. It was about their marriage and their son who loses his leg. And, sort of, and it, did deal, it did delve into their marital problems. And her drinking and sort of her depression around it. But I did try to, I, I, I remember thinking how difficult, trying to find her part, uh, I really felt how difficult it must have been to marry into such a famous family. And not just that, a family of such overachievers that all of them, I mean, look at Ted Kennedy's life. He didn't have to do any of that. He was born wealthy, he was, it, he obviously enjoyed life, you know, and yet he came, they really had this sense of duty, of service. And not everyone's got that. You know, if she didn't have that, she was thrust into that world. And I think that that just had to be so challenging. And if you didn't feel like you could live up to it, if you already had the very problems that would make you become an alcoholic, uh, of insecurity or whatever, I think that they just enhanced that. And she was not just him. She was surrounded by that whole family all of the time, of all over a cheers, of very positive people. And if you're not that, I'm sure it just was just so difficult and painful for her. I felt her pain a lot in doing that. And, uh, and Craig, uh, Craig um, Nelson, Craig T. Nelson played Ted Kennedy. He was wonderful. 
It's great. It's all great. First of all, it's great to have three cameras because you really don't have to watch. You have to do some matching, of course, because you're going to. But, but I mean, you you feel this freedom, and they're they're not really next to you, and they're not coming in. Although I. I think cameras are coming in less anyway now than they used to. <laughs> used to be in the middle of shots and results of the cameras coming right in. <laughs> you have to try and ignore it, you know. Um, but I think that the, the audience I love. Uh, for comedy, there's nothing better. And, you know, one of the things I love about Chuck Lorre is from the audition to every take you do, he is laughing. Now, you know it's difficult when you've already, we already know the joke, you wrote it, for God's sakes, and then you've, you've heard it over and over again. So he's doing it for us. It was one of the things that I really appreciated. Uh, first of all, I appreciated the audition. He and uh, Lee Aronson, they all do it there. It's, it's just a real uh, positive feeling that's supportive of the actors, I think. Because you just, believe me, you don't get that always. I've worked on some where you get none of that, where nobody, I'm not talking, just me, but nobody, they didn't laugh at anybody. And if, after they'd seen it, you know, uh, they didn't really try. But so, because so much of the time the audience isn't there, and you still need to know for your timing what's funny, what's working, and what isn't. But then when you actually can, you know, move an audience, and I've done, I did a wonderful comedy play that was that same sort of thing, and I loved it. That particular part that I was playing there, I didn't have, I didn't, you didn't want it to be too big at all because I, I always feel like I'm pretty much a setup for them. Although they did give me a lot of comedy too, which I was so grateful for. Um, when I was doing this play in La Jolla called Diva, it was bigger, but once again, I, it was a character that was based on. Um, she was, she was based on, the, the writer had written her around different characters that had been big TV stars who were difficult. <laughs> and that's how I was playing a difficult TV star. So there was a lot of narcissism, and, and, and that was just a, her, the comedy was in the cluelessness, her own cluelessness of, of the things that she was saying. She just didn't, you know, she didn't, so you couldn't play it too much. You just had to play the reality, but as I say, you always have to, you always have, to have your funny bone. You know that you're doing comedy. If you said the same lines and you weren't doing comedy, there's a difference in how it comes out. I think each role is different for me, but um, I think the most important thing, for the, the t one of the most important things is get your lines down. I, as I said, the way I learn them, I can learn the lines, I can start to learn the lines because I'm not going to learn about the character. I can do it at any point because, because I'm not into the character. Once I'm into my character, before I arrive, I definitely, I like to think about everything about that character. I like to think about what how they feel about the important things, whether it's money or sex or their kids or their parents or uh, how they feel in general, um, what their background was like. And, and there's a lot that, it's just that's the fun part. It's like you create your own little novel, whatever it isn't in there, you can create it yourself. And the more specific you are, the more it helps me feel grounded as that person. Sometimes you have very little time. I mean, a lot of times I get a lot of, you know, at, at my age and my stage of my career, I get a lot of parts where they don't really, I could just arrive and do my lines and they wouldn't even probably notice the difference. <laughs> you know. So whatever I have time, I do, but sometimes you don't have time. Sometimes I get a job and I start the next morning and I'm working the first stop in the morning. So, I mean, I just have always loved the make-believe of acting and I think every actor does. But the more specific you can be for yourself and the more daydreaming you can do about your character, it gives me, a, you know, it gives me an excuse to, uh, to daydream, to put on some music and think about my character or take a walk and think about all the things. I think that's just kind of the fun part. Listen, at this age, I wish I'd care more about the money when I was younger, but I, I never did. I never did. I, I never cared about fame either, not at all. I have to be really honest. Although, to be honest, there's been lovely things about fame that if I had known they would be so nice, I would have cared more. Um, you know, it's, it's lovely to have people um, who know your work come up to you and often they remember it better than I do. <laughs> And, and that's just a lovely thing. It's just like you feel like you know people. They feel like they know you anyway. And, it, and, it's, and that's just a lovely, you know, it's like, what am I thinking about that song that uh, um, I have trouble with, with everything today. Let's see. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a Wonderful World, the Louis Armstrong song. You know, people come up and they say hello. They're really saying I love you. Well, listen, if you have any fame, I think you get a little bit of that <laughs> in your daily life, and it's nice.